Kamarita mihi mahana kia koutou katoa, a warm and wonderful greeting to each and every one of you. When I tell people I'm a principal, I normally meet, get met by one of three reactions. They either suddenly sit up straight and rigid like they're in assembly, eyes glaze over as you can see the instant onset of boredom, or you can see them frantically looking for the nearest exit to escape through. But when I tell people I'm a disruptor of educational norms, I normally get the opposite reaction. People lean in, they're interested and focused. So I am a disruptor of educational norms, which basically means I'm a principal, uh, but much cooler. <laughs> in fact, I like to liken what we do to, to the television series uh, Deadliest Catch. You see, they have schools of fish, and we have schools of children. They too, like us, can have calm one minute and suddenly a raging storm out of nowhere the next. The biggest point of difference is, however, if they get it wrong, they are potentially putting themselves at risk. But if we get it wrong, we are potentially putting a large number of future lives at risk. I come from a long line of educators, even though only two people in my family formally trained as teachers. My mother, who started off as the cleaner of the school where she eventually became the principal, and my father, who was a second-generation freezing worker, but after the closure of our local works, retrained to become a secondary teacher. They both taught me, they both taught me the value of education. But it wasn't until I was working in the New Zealand prison system alongside young 16 to 20-year-old men who were not devious bastards. They were just young people who had not been given the same cultural and educational capital that I'd been given, that I found my real passion for education. I believe that New Zealand has the potential to have a world-class education system. We have this creative and clever New Zealand curriculum document we have responsive and caring professionals, and we have this international reputation for our number eight wire, innovative, can-do attitude. But I am concerned. I am concerned that while we are on the cusp of the most exponential change, unlike anything we have ever experienced before, when we most need to be leaning in and focused and energised, we are at risk of being rigid, of our eyes being glazed over and looking for our nearest exit. I am concerned that in our environment, where we hold all the power, where our perceptions and our bias can effectively make or break, that any inability to not respond speedily and smartly may well inadvertently be creating the here and now equivalents of the 1900s strapping of young children for speaking their own language in our education system. And it really doesn't have to be that dramatic or daunting. All it takes is a change of mindset. Just over three years ago, I walked into my once-in-a-lifetime. I walked into the principalship of a school that was under statutory management, had amongst the lowest achievement rates in our country, an incredibly high suspension rate, a declining role, low staff morale, and a decreasing connection with the community that it served. In fact, I remember the first time that I walked in there, and I remember seeing gang insignia that had been burnt into the ceiling. And I remember feeling both shocked and deeply saddened when I realised that these were not decommissioned learning spaces, but these young people with hopes and dreams and passion had to walk through this and under this and beside this and next to this, day in and day out. What a powerful message of how we viewed and valued them. But, as is the case, with any set of challenges, there's also an amazing set of opportunities. We just have to be open to seeing them. And so here was a school full of amazingly talented young people, a caring and connected staff. 
but also a community, a community that is representative of the epitome of strength and agility, a community that is also representative of the lowest socioeconomic bracket in our country, with an average household income of $17,000 per annum. And I have to tell you, they weren't surviving, but they were thriving, and they were full of love and hopes and dreams for their young people. And so, we had to set about creating an innovative response. And we had two other major areas that helped to bring this together. You see, because we were the largest employer in our township, and we were potentially facing closure, that gave us this very strong sense of urgency. And two, as I like to put it, we were in this unique and privileged situation, and that it didn't matter what we did, we couldn't go any lower than where we were. Which meant that we had this amazing blank canvas in which to innovate and create an educational response. The single most significant thing that we did that helped us on our journey is we changed our mindset to a relentless commitment as educators to innovate. And when I say innovate, I mean innovation in its totality. Innovation around systems and structures, innovation around curriculum, around assessment, around pedagogical practices. An innovative response that put every child at the centre and the community at the heart of everything we did. And so even though we have buildings that are around 60 years of age, there is nothing about us that looks or sounds or feels like a general stream state school, even though that is exactly what we are. We have flexible hours of operation, we have a flexible timetable, we have a flexible curriculum, we have no bells. In fact, we close the school every second Friday and the community at large becomes our classroom so our young people can take part in experiential and authentic learning opportunities like surf and turf, or boat making, or environmental fitness. A fusion of passion of students, staff, and the community. Some of our other innovative responses include the flexible hours of operation, so our young people can start school at 7.30. You see, we were losing a large number of our senior students to part-time work. And remembering our response, see if we put the students at the centre, the community at the heart, we felt we had no right to tell those young people to forfeit their well-earned income and well-needed income. Flexible hours of operation meant they could start school at 7.30, finish at 2, have a four out of a five-day week, just like university students, they could have full-time education, part-time work, or part-time education, full-time work. We also had major issues with reading, writing and maths. In fact, these groups of students in our country that do and have for far too long. But we believe if you look at the problem for too long, you run the risk of sameness. Sameness in what you see the problem being, therefore sameness in your solution and sameness in your outcomes. So we decided to tackle our issues around reading, writing and maths by not concentrating on reading, writing or maths. We have literacy and numeracy across the school, but it's in all of its context. So a young person particularly passionate about media is able to pursue their literacy progressions through media. Equally, a young person who's on the pathway to building can get their numeracy credits by contextualised, authentic building opportunities of measurements and angles and doing. We also have integrated STEAM, science, technology, engineering, the arts and maths, and inquiry-based learning. So every term, we have a whole school topic based around a local or global issue, and our young people are able to personalise their learning as well as innovate and create their own responses to challenges. So we've had young people that worked with local scientists, went out, got science credits. They wrote a report about this, got English credits. They then presented this report to select parliament and gained speech credits. 
The one rule that we have with our student learning is make it big and make it bold. We want it to impact change, we want it to make a difference, and we absolutely do not want it to be closed up at the book at the end of each term. And let me tell you about some of their big and bold. It is just wow. We have had young people that have travelled to Stanford University and presented their app designs at Silicon Valley. Equally, we've had young people that travelled to Fiji Silver and did uh, literacy and numeracy programmes in orphanages over there. They've planted 100 family fruit trees for future generations, connecting past students with present students, feeding future students. They have started the first ever Taranaki intergenerational sustainable cafe. They held a feast or famine banquet where they invited 250 shakers, movers and innovators and doers from our country who were by luck of the draw given a bowl of rice or a feast. At the same time, they shared their responses to challenges of local and global issues, including worldwide hunger. They started the quest for a dress where they put out the request for pre-loved ball dresses and suits so that they could attend their first school ball in close to 25 years. This has now become a roving ball boutique for other young people in our country to benefit from. And just a couple of weeks ago, the Surf and Turf course collected seafood locally that they served up on the platters to our acting Prime Minister and his team, as well as sharing their viewpoints and their thoughts and ideas on environmental fitness and wellness for our community. These young people have always, they have always been amazing. But just three years ago, they were being bismally failed by our education system. And now they are challenging every perception of who they are and who they're going to become. They are achieving above national averages at all NCA levels. They have seen the school roll double, and they were the recipients of the National UNESCO Award for Education Global Citizenship. But what's more, they are igniting many other flames of innovation. I have to tell you, when it comes to innovative responses in education, I've heard it all. I've heard it all, I've dealt with it, I have argued with anything you could possibly imagine. I hear it's good for new build schools, or underperforming schools, or high decile schools, or low decile schools, or if only that school down the road would get their act together, or, you know what, it's the kids and their parents that are to blame, not education. But I want you to know, Innovative responses in education is absolutely not about a set of buildings. It is not about socioeconomic status. And it is not about any other predetermined set of demographics. And it is most definitely not about us resting on our laurels. It's about young people. It's about learning communities. It's about us all having a set of lens on so firmly that no matter who the child, what their context, where they're from, what they bring, we work together to give them the set of skills and tools that they need to not only succeed, but to lead in whatever the future may be. Just before I came here, I met with a group of students, and I said, I'm going to be speaking to a room full of very important people. What would you like me to share on your behalf to inspire them to be big and bold? They told me to tell you, I am not one in a million. I am once in a lifetime. <laughs> 